So what Citizen Gordon asked me to do was to give a, a brief introduction on, um, I guess, kind of what is Judo Kwan, especially um, the transition from Tang Tzu to Taekwondo. Tang Tzu being the, being the predecessor of art to uh, Taekwondo. What happened? How did it happen? Why did it happen? All those kind of questions. Um, and, and as you probably noticed, and I was explaining to the twins, uh, I'll kind of explain to everybody, you probably see a little bit different symbolism with the different uniforms that we have in here, right? Um, and so a lot of these are Judo Kwan traditions. So if you go back to your, um, your pre Taekwondo history, you have the nine Kwans, and every Kwan had their own kind of different traditions that, uh, that they did, which for me is, as a church guy uh, makes me think of like all the different rites of Sui Juris in the church. You know, you have like your Malachites, your Syrians, your um, uh, Alexandrites, and things like that. You know, and every single one has the same doctrine kind of in a way, but different expressions of that rite. And so it's the same thing kind of with the Kwans, right? Um, they all have their various traditions, and so if you kind of look at the different things we have here, so black belts for Judo Kwan typically have uh, a midnight blue color to it, because in the Korean culture for Tang Sudo, they said that black symbolizes perfection. And so with that, if you had a black belt, it means you couldn't learn anything, because black is the fullness of the color spectrum, right? So midnight blue means that you're kind of almost there, but you still have something to learn. And so if you look at the other belts and the, the uniforms, I'll start with Master Eric, who's the next step up. He's a master, has a fifth degree, he wears a, uh, a belt with a red stripe through it, and then he has his, uh, his uh, top with the, uh, the white diamonds. When you hit sixth degree and you have a master under you, like Sensei Gordon does, he has a master underneath him as well, so he wears a red diamond top. Same thing, he's got the midnight blue with the red stripe belt through it. And then Sensei Hatfield, who is a seventh day, and when you hit seventh through ninth, you have a yellow stripe running through your belt. Uh, and then he'll wear uh, the other option he wear for his top is the yellow. Diamond pattern? So it could be yellow and diamond, or it could be yellow with red diamond also. Right. So, so that's what you're seeing here. Another Kwan, for example, the Chungdo Kwan, uh, their black belts have uh, the lines just like you see in a row, the broken lines, and because for them that represents the journey that they're on as a martial artist. So the different Kwans all have different traditions. So the big question I kind of want to go through today is, and I'm starting with the smaller sheet first. Uh, this is <coughs> Why, how did we go from Tang Tzu to Taekwondo? How did this all happen around you know, the time of the Korean War, post-World War II, all these things? So the big question is, why did the Korean Kwans transition? That's the big question. Why? What are the reasons? And we can look at the history, the objective history, but it's kind of hard sometimes to piece together why. And everyone has a different question as to why they did it. Um, their motivations were mostly on the same page, but some of them not. Because as we still see today, there is still Tang Tzu Do. There are still Tang Tzu Do schools. There's some that unified, there's some that, um, that the, the, the Kwans themselves splintered, and you had factions from each Kwan that joined in the Taekwondo and that stayed with Tang Sudo. So let's set the stage here first. So we're looking at, right before World War II, we're looking at the last Korean dynasty, the Great Joseon. So this was from 1392 up until it was replaced by the Korean Empire in 1897. And then it was, at that time, it was a tributary of China. Uh, the Qing Dynasty. So what you see with Taekwondo, all the symbolism, if you look at things like the Korean flag, right, this is not specifically Korean material, right? You look at what we call the Taegook, right? This is what they'll call Bumyang or Yinyang uh, from the Chinese traditions. A lot of this is Confucian and, and Tao tradition, right? So because, again, Korea was part of China at that time, they had their own distinct culture, which is why the Korean Peninsula kind of exists as its own two nations today. But it was a part of China at that time. So then what happens is uh, Japan takes influence over Korea uh, with the Treaty of 1876, uh, but not to the point where they were really, they hadn't annexed it, it kind of just became a protectorate, right? And so then the Korean Empire becomes a protectorate of Japan in 1905, so a little bit more control. So what you see is the Japanese starting to take more and more control of Korea. And then by the time we get to 1910, Japan formally annexes Korea, right? We should all know what annexing means now because we just saw a year ago Russia do the same thing to, uh, to Crimea in 2014 and then last year with the eastern half of Ukraine, right? So Japan comes and actually takes control of Korea, right? And it remains that way up through the end of, the, of World War II. So for 35 years, Japan is occupying Korea. And during the occupation, the native Korean martial arts like Taekyeon, which has been practiced for centuries, Subak, not the same thing as Subak Do, but similar sounding name, Subak, all these things were practiced before the occupation, but they became suppressed. All that was allowed to be taught was Japanese arts, because the Japanese thought that their arts, karate, judo, were superior to the Korean arts. 
And so with that, during the occupation, you have what we call like the fathers of Tang Soo Do, uh, the fathers of these Kwans, uh, before maybe some of them were even formalized Kwans, uh, traveling to China, traveling to Japan, learning Kung Fu, learning Karate, Judo, all these Japanese martial arts. So Master Li, he was descended from the Chang Yu Kwan, right? So the founders of the Chang Yu Kwan and the Jido Kwan were so close that they were thought to be brothers. And so our traditions are very similar in that regard. So that's why we teach Basai. I don't know if you do the Basai. I don't do the Basai. Okay, so, um, but Master Lee taught it at some point. So yeah. So some of the forms, if you look in the book that like Mr. Richard had put together a few years ago, that's got some of the forms that were carried over. They're Tongsu the forms. So he had Naihanchi. So Master Lee at one point taught Naihanchi. He taught the, the, uh, the Kicho forms. Uh, he would have taught at one point the Pyunan forms. So he's teaching this because this was from the Chen Yu Kwan's Tang Sudo um, history. Same thing with the Jido Kwan, because those two guys, they went to, they traveled together and then learned from the same guys. They both learned under the teaching of the Koshi. So with that, um, we get to, where am I out of here? So after the occupation, the Korean martial arts schools, uh, they're primarily teaching karate, but they're using Korean symbolism, the Korean language, and what they did was they took the word karate do, which originally translates to way of the China hand. What the Japanese did was they said, they, they have a, almost like a synonym, kara can also mean empty hand. So they call it way of the empty hand. So that's why you often hear it translated as way of the empty hand, but originally it meant way of the China hand, because the origins of karate, especially from Okinawa, and this is kind of one of the, the quasi-factual things of the Karate Kid when Mr. Miyagi's talking about his, his ancestor going to China, coming back with the secret of Miyagi no Karate, right? That's where a lot of them got this from, was a lot of this had influences from China. So Tang Sudo is the Korean translation of Karate Do, and so Tang from, from, from the Tang Dynasty, so the same kind of thing, way of the Chinese hand. So what happened again, the Japanese kind of wanted to distinguish themselves from China, so they call it way of the empty hand, right? It's the play on the word there with the translation. So if you look at Tang Sudo, right, as, as, it, as it kind of developed out of karate, the forms from Tang Sudo are adopted from, mostly from Shotokan, which is why you'll see in Tang Sudo you'll have these forms that have one name, but they also have a very similar name or sometimes completely different from their Japanese counterparts. So the, the group rank forms for Tang Sudo, we call them the Pyung'an forms, but in Japanese they're called Pinan. So you see there's a very similar name there. A little bit more Japanese with Pinan, Koreans with Pyung'an. But if you look at some of the black belt forms, you have the Korean name Jindo and a completely different name Gankaku. Right? But it's the same forms. It's just you see a little bit of changes from the Korean side when they kind of came over the Tang Sudo. Um, as what, I think Sensei Gordon told me the other night, anything that Tang Sudo took from karate just, just made it ugly. <laughs> so, um, but it's, it's, nonetheless, it's the same forms. And so that's why there's an argument, that's why there's a lot of people who call Tang Sudo Korean karate, because that's essentially what it is. If you pass by home at Tang Sudo, um, you'll see it on there. It says karate lessons. Because that identifies so much with the fact that their style really is karate at its essence. It's just using Korean terminology, Korean culture, the Korean language, all those things. So they call it the Korean karate. So with that, things begin to change. So after World War II, these Korean masters come back. They're starting to open their own schools. They're re kind of reintroducing the native Korean arts as well as Tang Sudo, as well as karate. And so we have the Korean War. The Korean War was, was a time where a lot of things changed. You had a lot of these guys, so the original founder of the Chengdu Kwan, Yun Byung-in, went missing during the Korean War. They said missing, I think he actually defected to North Korea, right? And a lot of them did this, right? The Korean War was a, a civil war for the Korean Peninsula. So you had some guys who were living in one part of Korea who defected to the north, who defected to the south. A lot of the, the, the leadership of these Kwans changed during the war. After the war was where things kind of started to subside. So, in 1952, so the Korean War hasn't even really ended yet, right? The Korean War ends in 1953, if I'm not mistaken. Greg, right? you're the nearest historian. So, yeah. So, in 1952, the president of, of the southern Korean portion, Syngman Rhee, witnesses a demonstration by Choi Hong Hee, one of his army officers, and Nam Tai Hee. And so, he actually he, he misidentified, is, is what the term is used, uh, if you look at the records, what this art was. He didn't know what it was at first. So to me, it sounds like the president was not a martial artist himself. He just sees this demonstration done by some of his army officers, and he says, okay, he said, I like this stuff. I want to introduce it as our hand-to-hand -hand combat for our army. 
So what he wants to do is he wants to, he tells these guys, I know we have a bunch of these schools in the Korean Peninsula. Can we unify under one curriculum to make one system that we can introduce first and foremost to the army? All right, this was meant to be self-defense. Now we know we have World Taekwondo, which oversees the sports side of, of Taekwondo nowadays. Um, and you can argue that it's foot fencing now. You know, there's all kind of, you know, it, 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 it looks trashy at this point. It doesn't look like it's self-defense. But ta uh, Taekwondo was designed to be self-defense. And so there always should be an aspect of that teaching to where, yeah, you're not going to be able to stretch before a street fight. So are you going to be throwing spinning 365, 40 foot kicks to somebody's head? Probably not. You can't say, oh, wait, stop. I haven't stretched. You know, you can't stop and do that. So there is a, a specific way that Taekwondo is meant to be practiced where it is self-defense oriented and practical that you can use at any time. You don't have to stretch. Right. So it was designed to be self-defense from the beginning. But here's the problem is that General Choi advocates for the new art to be called Taekwondo. He's the one who kind of coined the term. But the problem is he wants it to be his style and his style only. And since Gordon was telling me this last night, um, General Choi founded the Odo Kwan. And remind me, what, what does Odo Kwan mean? So the word Odo Kwan literally translates as school of my way. Right? <laughs> <laughs> School of my way, or I guess if you're the Chungo Kwan, you can say my way or the highway. It's <laughs> like a highway, so I guess you have it. That was kind of the argument, I guess you could put it that way. So General Choi said, okay, we can unify these schools, but we're going to unify under my curriculum. And they had a problem with that, right? Because these other schools had their own unique traditions, right? They didn't want to completely abandon everything that their founders had worked for. And so this is where you start having some infighting. And, and remember this thing, too. Anytime the government gets involved with something, of course it's going to be political. No doubt. Like, oh, yeah, well, the Korean government's going to establish this unification of Taekwondo. It's going to be political? Nah. Right? No, like, it is. That's what happens. So, of course, you're going to have infighting. Of course, you're going to have, you know, differences in opinions. And so, what happens is in 1959, the Korean Taekwondo Association is established called KTA. And it was designed to oversee the unification of their curriculums. Now, remember, Choi wanted to be under his system. A lot of the Kwan leaders didn't like that. So very quickly, Choi kind of became ostracized, right? And so and what also pissed off the South Koreans was the fact that he wanted to bring his art to North Korea. And guess what? That's, yeah, you, you want to really stir the pot? That's, uh, that's Pabon, right? As we say down here in Louisiana, that's, that's, that's uh, très Pabon, vraiment Pabon. Um, and so, so he really kind of, he, he exiles himself. He ends up leaving Korea. Uh, peninsula. He founds what's called the International Taekwondo Federation, uh, which is kind of more similar to, like, I guess, as far as the foundation, the foundation, the basics, their execution, very similar to what they were doing with Tom Sudo. Uh, but he creates his own system of forms, right? So that's the ITF. It's not even headquartered in Korea anymore. In fact, there's several divisions of the ITF that all kind of split off because, again, when you have one break, you tend to have more, right? If you if you have one break off in any organization, chances are you're going to continue to see divisions happening. That's what happens. So now you have offshoots of the ITF. Uh, off the ITF, you have branches of ATA. You have all kind of other organizations that branch off from there. Elements from all nine quans came from the unification, but you had elements from those quans that also broke off. Probably one of the most splintered ones is the Mudu Quan. Mudu Quan is the, a private, one of the primary schools that still preserves Tang Sudo. So you had, um, Drawing like his name, Hoang Ki. Uh, Hoang Ki established the Mudu Kwan in Korea uh, and very quickly did not want to come under the unification. Uh, so, what he did was he sent several of his black belts around the world to teach organizations. This is kind of the history also of the World T uh, Tang Association that Homa Tang Sudo was a part of. So, he sends Grandmaster Shen to the United States and he sends Master Shen to basically establish a Tang Sudo organization. And Master Shen does that. But what happens is uh, Hoang Ki basically says, okay, thank you for your work, now I'm going to send my son to take over all the work that you just did. And guess who that pissed off? Master Shin. And Gabby's face says it all. Like, really? Yeah, that's, that's what this was all about, was whose son takes over what? It was very hereditary in a way. Um, and so Grandmaster Shin leaves the organization he founded, because now Hoang Ki's son's taking it over, and Grandmaster Shin then establishes the World Tang Sudo Association. But it's still essentially Mudu Kwan Tang Sudo. Now, the main element of the Mudu Kwan, Huang Ki's actually main branch of the Mudu Kwan, became Subakdo Mudu Kwan. It's still Tang Sudo. It's what they were teaching before the merger, but now they call it Subakdo, right? But it's Subakdo Mudu Kwan. Am I getting all this right so far? Yeah. Okay, cool. If I'm, if, if I'm saying something wrong, let me know. Stop me, please. You're good. Um, 
So, uh, so this is where Tongsudo is still heavily practiced by, by descendants of the Mudu Kwan. But what happened was, especially with the Jido Kwan, the Jido Kwan was the last of the nine Kwans to come under the unification. And so with that, after the Mudu Kwan, the Jido Kwan still has a heavy Tongsudo curriculum, right? And so with that, this is where the American Jido Kwan Association still has branches of Tongsudo and Taekwondo. So with that, um, let's get to the original question we're asking anyway, the vision of Taekwondo. Why was a new system needed when effective ones were already in place? When you had things that worked like karate, like judo, all these things worked. And I think the question, the answer really comes down to this. It's the same reason why the Japanese wanted to retranslate karate though from the China hand to way of the Indy hand. Because they wanted to establish their own identity. Right? Think of it this way. 35 years you've been oppressed. And especially when we get to the imperial years, you get to the years leading up to World War II. 1930 was an awful decade for China, for Korea, because of the occupation of Japan, right? We can all go in the history textbooks and look, especially in the 1930s, all the atrocities committed by Japan in the 1930s and the 1940s. And so when you finally are free of this oppressive organization, and unfortunately the North Koreans are still under one, at least for the South Koreans, if you're trying to establish a national identity, you're trying to rediscover yourself as a people, what are you going to tend to want to do? You're going to want to cast off anything having to do with that organization, that entity that oppressed you for so long, right? And so I think that's really one of the big reasons for them establishing, you know, Taekwondo, which still has the same basics, a lot of the same fundamentals, a lot of the same characteristics as karate, but a lot of this is, is really in the symbolic aspect, the mindset, the symbolism, right? And so if you look at something like the Korean flag, right, and this is kind of part of it, this is... This is Taekwondo in a way. I mean, if you look at it, and this is what I have on here as well, the second sheet is basically kind of explaining what's happening here on this flag, right? If you look at the symbolism. So the first set of forms that the KTA came up with besides the black forms was the Pogways, right? And if you look at any article that says, you know, the, the Pogways were established in, I think it was, what, 19, uh, what year I put on here? 1971. 67. 67. And then in 1971, so we're talking about four years later, they replace it with the tables. No one will actually give you, no, no article, no kind of scholarly source will really tell you exactly why did they, after four years, do away with the Pogways and then adopt the tables. Presumably the answer is the Pogways look too Japanese. And I'll be honest, having done the Pogways and the Pungon forms, I can tell you, the Pungons are more like the Pogways than they are like the tables by a long shot, right? And so what's happening here is in Pogway basically is the word for these trigrams, right? If you look on this diagram, you see the circle of the eight trigrams, and that's, that's basically from the Taoist cosmology. And what happens is if you look at the order, it's opposites. So if you look at, you see where number one is, right? The three solid bars, that's heaven, which, by the way, if you look at the Korean flag, if you look at it this way, if it's flying, this is heaven over fire and water over earth, right? These aren't quite opposites, not as they are here, but well, think of it this way, heaven over hell, and the fact that rain falls to the earth and not vice versa, right? So there, there's this kind of concept here of umin yang or yin yang, or as they actually call this in Korean, teguk. Teguk is the word for the yin yang. It has to do with fluctuations of these things, right? That's what the forms, the guk right forms for Taekwondo do. So part of this was that they wanted to reclaim, and again, a lot of this is Chinese, not, not per se Korean. And so what they're trying to do is to reestablish that identity. Right, to kind of get away from some of this Japanese stuff. But this was on their flag. They adopted this. This is their philosophy of the changing world around them. That's what Umin Yang stands for. Take a look. Is the fact that these things are in constant flux with each other. Right? Almost seamless. Sometimes flowing. And so if you look at the way the forms are arranged, right? And this is where, if you look at the names, this is on the back side of this, this, this bigger paper. Right? Hallway and Take Look Iljong have the same meaning. It's heaven. Now, what's the opposite? What's underneath heaven? Earth, right? So if you look at Pogway 8, Pogway 8 is earth. You have Pogway Ejang, lake. Where do you often find lakes? In the valleys in between mountains. So you see how 2 and 7 are opposites, right? Then you have um, Pogway and Tegok Samjong. What's the symbol for that? Fire. What's the opposite of fire? Water. So you see how the Tegoks are, it, it works in that, it works as opposites. And it's, again, this whole concept of these trigrams, these piled ways, working according to the principle of Teguk, right? That's how this is operating here. 
And then if you look at the black belt forms, this is where I find, I really find that they really went to what symbolizes Korean culture, right? The names of these forms, what they mean. And notice that most of these forms come from Chinese characters, right? So Korea, it's the ancient name for Korea. It's a Chinese character for scholars. So you see how they're incorporating a lot of these Chinese elements as well, because they realize that it, it's not quite, Korean culture is distinct, but it's not like it was just originally made out of nowhere, right? They realize this, this comes from China. And so you look at Kungan, Ch uh, Chinese character for mountain. Uh, but then we finally start to get to a Korean character when we get to Chite, right? And so the character for Chite is the Korean vowel O. So finally we get a Korean symbol in the black belt forms. Up until then, it's all uh, Chinese. And then the last one. Some of you guys are probably freaking out about this last one on here, right? <laughs> Everybody knows what that is. Everybody should know what this is, right? But there's a very big difference with the Buddhist swastika and the Nazi swastika. Does anybody know what that difference is? Gabby? Yeah. It's flipped. That's the, and, this was, and this is why you know, people see this symbol, and even in the Buddhist context, they, they mistake it for the Nazi one because they, they realize, or what they, they don't realize, is that the Nazis adopted the swastika but flipped it. And so when you do ilio as a form, when you go in any of those directions, when you, you make the cross, but then you make that bar at the top, you're always turning to the left. No matter which way you're facing, you're always turning left, and you're making those lines on each end. The Nazi one goes the other way. You'd be turning to the right if it was a Nazi swastika. But it's originally a Buddhist symbol, right? And so, again, this whole concept here is in, in that it, And this is the thing, too. You can also ask, well, why did some people stick, stick with Thomas Sudo? If you ask me, probably the politics, right? Again, the government stepped in. The Kukiwan is run by the, the South Korean Minister of Culture and Sport, right? And so with that, some of them didn't like the politics. Hoang Ki certainly did not like the politics. That's a big thing. Who in here likes politics? Unless you're you know, a political science major, probably none of us, right? A lot of us like to talk politics, but a lot of us, we talk about it because we can't stand it. <coughs> that's a big part of this, right? So. But I think that's a big reason as to why the switch, you know, why this transition from Taekwondo to Tang Sudo. But at the same time, it's important that we don't forget our history, that we don't forget where we come from. And which is why organizations like the American Judo Plot Association continue to preserve the old as well as the new. Because if you forget where these arts came from, why are we doing Taekwondo? You know, so that's a big reason. You can't forget the past, otherwise you will repeat.